And we are live. You are now tuned in to Mind, Body, and Soul with Annette. For your host, Annette Harris, analyze intriguing life questions and concerns, such as, do Christians suffer from mental illness? Have you wondered why they act abnormal? You may ask, what is really going on in their minds? Do you need a nap? Well, keep listening for a biblical understanding of the psychology of the mind. Hey, 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 guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another wonderful session of Mind, Body, and Soul with Annette. I'm your host, Annette Harris. I want to thank you in advance for watching and or listening. Before I go further, I must acknowledge the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have blessed us to see. We thank you for who you are, how you are. We give you glory, honor, and praise because it is due you. We thank you even for this segment, this special segment that we are venturing into on today. We pray that you would get all the glory and that others will be helped by this segment. In Jesus' name we pray. And the opening scripture is the first part of Hosea 4 and 6, and it states, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. And again, I'm excited. I'm grateful to be here on this afternoon. If you see my face, then that means it is another Wednesday that the Lord has blessed us to be here. And, you know, just come on in with us on today. You are going to be very, very uh, pleased. You're going to learn a lot um, during this segment on today. I have a two for one, if you will. Uh, two guests that are going to come in and talk to us today. I was impressed. Uh, probably about maybe some weeks ago to do a segment talking about COVID-19 survivors. I knew of a few, um, but I put out a little poll or um, if you will, in asking individuals if you wanted to participate, um, then to hit me up and to contact me. So some of you reached out to me and then some of uh, you, I reached out to you. So during the month of July, we're going to have this segment, a special segment talking about those survivors of COVID-19. And I am excited to do this because of course, I mean, we all know that we're going through this pandemic and uh, everything is, is, is happening um, all at once. Um, seems like it's a little bit overwhelming for us, if you will. But I, I just thank God because you know sometimes we can look at um, we can look at the news and we kind of get a little bit overwhelmed by statistics and talking about all those in individuals that have actually succumbed to COVID nineteen. But I want to talk about those that have survived, that have hung in there. And so you see with me today a beautiful woman of God. I tell you, she, she's, a, she's been a, a quiet individual since I've met her. Now, those of you that really, really know her, like she ain't quiet, don't know where you're getting that from. But she's been so uh, from the moment that I have met her and I have been pleased to make her acquaintance and to call her my friend. Um, Joining me today, and I'm going to read a little bit of her bio, but joining me today is Rolanda, Prophetess Rolanda McKee-Smith is here. How are you doing today? I am wonderful. I am wonderful. Um, I am so grateful to, to be with you. I'm so grateful to be in the land of the living. Let me just say that. Let yeah. me just, just start out by saying that in the context of what we're talking about today, I'm, I'm just, I'm pleased to be as my grandfather would say, six feet above ground. <laughs> I heard a little bit of your testimony, um, which is actually, Rolanda is one of them. I said earlier that I reached out to some and some reached out to me. I reached out to her because I wanted to hear, uh, well, I want her to share her journey with you all. I heard a little bit of it when I was on a um a conference Zoom uh, with uh, Dr. Laura Michael Hunt and uh, uh, Joe, uh, Prop Joe Hunt and uh, Apostle Hunt. And she came on and she was telling about talking about her journey and my mouth was open. I was like, what? And so I said, I wanted her to, to talk today to you all about what she's dealing with. Let me read just a little bit. She is hilarious. I, you know, that's one thing I'm <laughs> hilarious. 
He kept telling me, uh, no, I don't know. And I, I, I was almost uncertain if I would get her on here today, but she gave me what she called a short, short bio. So I'm going to read a little bit of that. <laughs> to talk about who she is on today. Rolanda Smith is a minister, wife, mother, nana, and cosmetologist born in Chicago, Illinois. She joined Faith Cathedral Total Man Ministries in 1997 under the leadership and tutelage of Chief Apostle Dr. Lord M. Hunt, overseer and pastor Ferris, I believe that is, and yeah. Cynthia Davis. She was encouraged to enroll in SCOPE, and that stands for School of Apostles and Prophets, where she was ordained in 2005 to a minister. As she continued to serve in various capacities of ministry, God revealed her calling. And under the leadership of Apostle Dion and Pastor Cecilia Hunt of Saul Call the Center Church, she was yep. ordained to the Office of Prophet in 2007. Rolanda has always steered away from public speaking, which is why I didn't know I would get her on today, and <laughs> referred to her salon styling chair as her pulpit. It's always been said, hairstylists wear many different hats, therapists, doctors, mediators, etc., due to the various conversations they have with clients. Rolanda is devoted not only to personal beautification, but helping to heal hurting hearts. I love that. Rolanda says this is where God uses her the most and she's forever grateful. Rolanda resides on the south side of Chicago with her husband, Daryl, of 27 years. Again, welcome to my body and soul. She can't get caught in the net, y'all. Rolanda, prophetess Rolanda <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in on today. Well, of course, we're doing everything virtually, guys, but I can still say it like that. Um, but yeah, we, I, you know, I've given the intros and everything, and I do want to recognize those of you that are on the Facebook Live, because we are on my page, Annette Knows Annette, and then also the audio of the session right now is on my YouTube channel. Once a segment ends, then the entire video will be uploaded to my YouTube channel. So, and if you haven't done so, please go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. A little commercial break there. All right. <laughs> a few individuals. I see you, Gloria. I see you, Carolyn, Kamitris, uh, Marcus is on. Apostle, hey, Apostle. Uh, Dominic is watching. Karen, uh, my super duper producer, Earl is on. Jasmine Wooder Jones, uh, Deatrice Carter, Michelle Hollins, Casey, Eric uh, is on. They're all greeting us and saying, Amen. Robin, I see you. Thank you for watching. And Elise Crawford. If you haven't done so yet, guys, Click that share button. You know what I say? It costs you nothing. It doesn't even cost you a penny. It costs you nothing. Go ahead and click the share button and then that way others will know that this wonderful segment is happening and that they will not miss a beat. The uh, second segment will feature Jasmine and she's watching now um, at uh, around the one o'clock hour. So one o'clock central standard time. So I won't, don't want you guys to miss anything. So Rolanda, let's hop right in this with both feet, both hands. I want you to talk to us about this COVID, how uh, you were affected. Tell us about the, whatever you can leading up to it and, and, and everything that goes into it. It's in your hands. Okay. Now, I know you mentioned, um, you mentioned earlier about uh, the, the Zoom conference uh, thing that we did with Dr. Hunt. Uh, what a lot of people didn't know, I was at that time, I was doing that Zoom from the rehabilitation center. So I was still actually uh, in the hospital. And uh, I listened, went back to that, uh, that recording um, this past Sunday, just to kind of see, you know, questions, what I wanted to talk about, basically to see where I was and where I am now. I sound a lot better. I can breathe a lot better. <laughs> As if anybody talked to me at that time when I was in the hospital, you know, we take things for, for granted, I think. Uh, just a mere blinking. You don't give a thought that your eyes are blinking. You did, they just blink. 
uh, breathing. You just know that just because you're up and then you're coherent, as we, would, we may say, that that next breath is going to actually come. Now, with COVID, you are literally in a warfare for, for just oxygen. It is, I'm learning still things about uh, my body and the way it changed uh, my, my body. And even looking at my husband, uh, things that, you know, he used to be able to do that he's not able to do. Now, this, this virus, it's so demonic. It, you know, I, I, I can't even compare it to anything other than if you've ever had the flu, you know how the flu feels. Uh, I've never had pneumonia, so I never know. I never knew what pneumonia per se feels like. Uh, I've always had allergies. Anybody that knows me from childhood knows that my allergies are horrific. Uh, nose swole up. I can't, you know, that's, that's a normal for me. Uh, not being able to smell or sometimes taste. My eyes is itchy, you know, upper respiratory issues. But COVID is, it's like a one-two punch. You have pneumonia and the flu combined together on steroids. That's about the only way I can explain it. And it's traveling through your body like a cancer, aiming to take the very, it, it was aiming to take my life. That's the only way I can explain it, being now on the other side of it. It is horrific. It is horrific. Uh, can I ask you, how did you even know that anything was different with you? Because you mentioned about your allergies and it sounds like some of the, the symptoms that you experience with allergies are some of the symptoms of COVID, right? It is, but but wait, let me tell you, I had no symptoms of COVID. When I went to the hospital, this was March the 21st, Daryl's birthday. My chest was hurting on my left side. Uh, I kept feeling this, it's like a, this dull, dull pain. I didn't have any respiratory issues. I didn't have loss of taste or smell. I didn't have a cough. I didn't have a fever. I didn't have any of that. I just had this dull pain in my chest. And it felt, the skin felt hot to touch. So I called my doctor. Um, you know, you speak to the nurse practitioner. Um, he was in the office, so she allowed me to speak to him. He told me to go over to the hospital, go to the hospital right away. I'm going to put in orders for you to have an EKG done. It sounds like a DVT, a blood clot. This is what it sounded like. It's what he said. Um, I'm on call at the hospital. I'm on duty at the hospital this evening, so I'll be there to check on you. I'm going to call ahead and tell him to put the orders and stuff in. Went through the emergency room. They did the EKG. Uh, took me up to do a CT scan. From that CT scan led to an MRI. Uh, because I have such allergies to different things, uh, they had to prep me for the MRI, contrast dyes, and things of that sort. Um, they saw the blood clot. I had a blood clot on my left lung. Um, kept me overnight started me on uh, heparin via IV, put me on them just a blood thinner. Now they're treating it. Now my doctor's there. He's looking at the, the, uh, the results. He wanted them to start me on heparin wider right away. I'm in the hospital, what I thought was for DVT, blood clot. So one of the nurses that was on duty caring for me, uh, this is two days in now. Um, I'm fast forwarding two days in. Um, they told me just abruptly, I'm asking for her, I'm ringing for her. Uh, she had to leave. They had to send her home. I said, uh, what was going on? Oh, she's sick. Now, some nurses was telling me that she was sick. It took a sister to come in, nurse, to tell me. Now, this is my, now my nurse that, that's caring for me. 
Um, now, she, now, understand, she all of the nurses was coming in, just masks. That's it. Gloves. That's it. The now nurse, the new nurse that's coming in to me now is <laughs> um, suited and booted. Let me just say it that way. She got all, she has on the whole face garb, the whole this, that, and the fourth. She tells me that the nurse that was caring for me was sent home because she had COVID. Uh, but she didn't know. She just now, periodically, they're checking for fevers. In between her taking care of me, now this is day two of her taking care of me, uh, she was uh, with another patient who had COVID. So now they've transferred me down to the COVID unit. Um, now I have to get tested. Get tested for, the, for COVID two, three days later. Now the first test they did in the emergency room, they tested me for uh, the flu. Now this is automatically. Now back in March, if you can remember, test, they weren't testing everybody. Right. The tests then were, uh, no, you have to you know, display these, these symptoms. You have to have this. You have to have that. You don't have a cough. We're not going to test you. They ended up testing me. They tested me again two days later because I now came in contact with somebody that had it. Three days later, I get the test results back. I'm COVID positive. In the midst of them doing this DVT, they had the person come in and do another scan because now I can't leave the room. I'm quarantined. Everybody that comes into me now has, has this space suit. Mind you, I still didn't have symptoms. The third day, that's when it hit me. And it, everything just started. It's like door shutting. It's door shutting. I got a fever. Uh, my body was aching. Nose was stopped up. Couldn't smell nothing. Couldn't taste anything. Body aching. Uh, a fever. My fevers were like running between 101 and 103. That occurred for five days, four or five days, about four that I know for a fact before my son stepped in and, and was demanding of the doctors uh, to uh, start me on an IV of vitamin C because he had read that John Hopkins was doing already doing their studies that vitamin C will kill, you know, kill, help to kill the virus. That's what my fever broke. They gave me two days of IV fluids along with this medication. I can't even pronounce the name, the one that your president is, is claiming that he took. And, <laughs> and an antibiotic, I don't know if it was working or not because, like I said, it wasn't doing anything. I was in the hospital, you know, three, four days in. And nothing was happening, but I thought I was dying. And it was about on the third, the third day that I just knew I was on, on my way out of here that I called my husband. And I don't know what just made me pick the phone up and call him. And now I'm crying because I'm saying, okay, I'm about to leave here. I feel like I'm about to die. And the way I feel and I don't think I ever told anybody this part. The way I felt, I was okay with it. I just wanted that to just stop. And I called Daryl and I, you know, I'm talking to him and I said, you know, I said, I feel horrible. I said, I've never felt this sick before in my life. And, and before I can say the words, I'm okay with it. He started talking, and he wasn't talking to me in himself. That's another sign of COVID, delirium, confusion. He was telling me, and this was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, he's saying to me, I can't find this scripture. I said, a scripture? He says, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find this scripture in the Bible. I got to speak. Everything that I felt like I was going going towards the light stopped. I said, Daryl, put the Bible down. Get to the hospital. 
Come to Christ Hospital right now. I need you to come right now. And that Daryl does not know how he even got to the hospital, how he parked the car, how he got in the emergency room. He doesn't remember any of that. They intubated him day two. He doesn't know any of that. He remembers nothing. He was on oxygen, at, well, on <laughs> intubated, on life support, might, might as well say, for about eight days, eight or nine days. So, yeah, that now, just going back to me, immediately now this is playing in my head. Lexi not going to be able to deal with both her parents gone. Ryan not going to be able to deal. You know, I got two grandbabies <laughs> that I need to see grow up. I was like, okay, now I got to fight because we can't lose both of us. Yeah. It's just, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is deep. So, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you got to the point to talk about your husband because both of you are affected, but obviously, so he probably didn't have any symptoms himself either originally. No, he did. Actually, he got sick at work. I'm, let me just digress back. I'm, at the time, caring for a loved one. I was caring for this loved one, staying in the house with the loved one, who at the time was getting ready to go, was, was actually not getting ready to go through, was going through chemotherapy. Um. <laughs> I'm so grateful to God that my contagious didn't happen. If I had a custom, I just don't know. My contagious didn't happen before I got to the hospital because, and then I'm a hairdresser. I had did clients the week prior. Um, I'm caring one-on-one. I'm one-on-one -on -one with this loved one. I'm fixing, preparing meals getting medications together. I'm one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'm so grateful to God that nothing happened to them. But uh, Daryl was caring for our, the same loved one. We're in the house with these, these people. We're in the house with them. Daryl called me from work saying, I got a fever. I'm just feeling awful. Um, I called my doctor. He did this conference call with me. Uh, he told me it sounds like the flu. I said to him, you can't come back over here. Not knowing I'm sick, you can't come back over here. You got to go to the, you know, go to the apartment and you have to stay there because you can't bring that over here. Because this loved one is so sick, uh, a mere cold can take them out. Their immune system is just totally shot. I said, you can't bring any of that. So mind you, I hadn't seen Daryl in about maybe nine days before I went into the hospital. See, I didn't see Daryl. Oh, my. Yeah, I, had, I didn't see him. That was like a nine-day period that I didn't see him. So mind you, I went in the hospital not even seeing him. And then in the hospital not knowing if he was going to leave here, too. Okay, so you really did get it when you were in the hospital. I'm sorry? I said, so you technically did get the virus while you were in the hospital. I don't know. See, that, that's the scary part. I don't know. Because I talked to my doctor, and he says, now, now they know about, see, they're learning Everything is a learning experience with this. We didn't know about asymptomatic back in March. That you can have, you cannot have any symptoms, but yet have a, a period of contagion. I could have been asymptomatic because I didn't have no symptoms, you know, any of the symptoms. But the, because of the precautionary measures I had started taking because of the virus, 
uh, Clorox wiping everything down. You know, that's sterilization and sanitation for hairdressers anyway. You know, they get out your chair. Now I'm, I'm being Katie the cleaning lady about it. I'm cleaning, wiping down and wiping down the bowls and wiping down everything. Uh, at the loved one's house, I'm constantly cleaning and wiping down and wiping down. That could have been the reason why they didn't get it. Because the germs that I could have been leaving, I probably cleaned away. So I don't know. I'm still asking God. I want to know. How did I get this? Where did I get this from? What was I doing and what was I not doing? Now, one thing that I know for a fact that I wasn't doing, which is hindsight now, is wearing a mask. Right. See, right. wearing a mask. <laughs> so you were not wearing a mask? No, we weren't wearing a mask. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, you didn't have to wear a mask then. You know, and then 45 was, you know, you don't have to wear it. You can and you can't. But then, you know, the CDC head, Fauci was saying, he was agreeing with the president. You, you don't have to if you don't want to. But it. You know, back in March, that was, it was early. That was so early, we didn't know. You know, I just knew this is a virus, and you got to treat this like a virus. Let me wipe stuff down, because then it was like, okay, you need gloves for everything, or you, you know, it can lay on stuff, or you touch this, or you do that. But because I'm feeling like, okay, I'm not sneezing, I'm not coughing, no extremities are coming from my mouth or anything. Let me protect what I touch. So now I'm cleaning. <laughs> Which makes sense. Typically what a lot of us were doing, especially before, like here in Illinois, before the masks were made mandatory. So we mm -hmm. were that we, you know, washed and cleaned everything. So I can understand that. But that, this is so deep. Let me hop over here real quick because I'm, they're throwing up comments and you, you have us in tears. I want you to know that. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, you, and no, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. We're just touched. We're touched by what we hear. Um, Brandy says here, it took her husband getting sick and thoughts of her children to give her a new fight for her life. Wow. And <laughs> reading that is, is touching me all the more because you were like, wait a minute. So, my baby ain't talking right. You know, you said before you could get out of your mouth that I'm okay. I'm going to die. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute. It was like Rolanda the servant kicked in. It was like, whoop. You know how you the, the, stop the tape. Wait a minute. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you talking like that? You know, are you losing it? Um, Come on to the hospital. Just come to the hospital. Because I, I don't know what I was thinking. They had me like the child and the kid in the plastic bubble. I couldn't leave the room. So I don't know. I'm telling him to come to the hospital. Like I could just leave and go see about it. <laughs> but you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful that you even had the presence of mind to tell him to come and that, you know, he listened. Like you said, however, well, we know the Holy Ghost got him there. That, that's how he got there. He may not yeah. That. yeah. Grateful that he heeded to that. And yes, because he never listens to me. <laughs> I'm so happy he listened. <laughs> uh, Daryl, I don't know if you listened today, but I'm glad you listened to me. All right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So let's see. Kenesha says you're a miracle. Praise God. Fight for the gift of life, Dr. Regina Brooks. Um, yeah. Robin says, I was about to say the same thing. Stepped away from death to reach back fight and fight. Who Jesus. Uh, Karen, we see you on. Thanks for watching. Uh, Robin says people are walking around asymptomatic and aren't even aware that they have it. This is why we must be careful. And if I, you know, we can throw anything in and drive anything home today, we want to tell people to steal because it has not gone away. It's, it's not. No. You know, not existent now or what have you. We're talking about her situation, and I think you went into the hospital. You said on your husband's birthday that was in March, was it? Uh huh. March the twenty first. March twenty first. And technically, how long were you in there from the hospital? Because you even had to do rehab, like you mentioned, after that, right? 
Yeah, I was in the hospital from March the 21st to April the 8th, and then went into rehab from April the 8th uh, until April the 17th. It was either the 17th or the 18th. But that was more so my doing because uh, I didn't want to come home by myself. I don't want to come home by by myself. And, you know, my children, uh, (laughs) you know, I got some fighters for some kids. I, I God bless me with two two persistent human beings. Uh, between Ryan and his, you know, my daughter in law, uh, staying on the doctors, and Alexis. <laughs> now this is the part. Oh God, Alexis had to be our voice. She had to make decisions medical decisions that I don't think any any child should have to make. They shouldn't have to make medical decisions. Uh, when my husband was getting ready to be, when Daryl was getting ready to be intubated, because I couldn't make that decision because I was in the hospital myself, she's calling me, mine, they're calling me, uh, I don't even know what intubation is. I don't even think she called it that. She probably mispronounced it. But they're saying something about they gotta put him on some type of breathing machine and I don't know what I don't know what to say. I said tell them yes. And then they're calling her in regards to me. So she's back and forth trying to make a decision for her parents. And my son is is two inches from coming to the hospital to beat up the doctors because he's feeling like they're not listening to him about my care, you know. So I've got these these they're they're adults, <laughs> but they're still my babies, fighting just as hard as I'm in the inside fighting to breathe, to stay alive for them. It's it's wow. it's it's unreal. I can't even I, I, I can't even put words to some things. It's just unreal. Um and I'm just so thankful. I'm so thankful. I am too. I'm so grateful to God that I survived. And you know, the reason why I probably was giving you such a hard time about not doing it because I I felt like because I was a survivor. It wasn't, you know, back in, in March, everybody was dying. Everybody was dying. They, they weren't even talking about survivors. I was in that room uh, for all those days because I was going back. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave the hospital not knowing, number one, I don't have it. You need to tell me for real, for real, that I'm negative. Number two, you got to make sure that I have antibodies in my blood. And because now they've given you your, your full run, and at this time they're giving you your full run and what they say medications, they want to kick you out. But now you still have to be quarantined. You still have to, even after the hospital, they want you to be quarantined for 14 days. Now, that's two weeks they're telling me I can't walk because like I said, this, this virus takes your energy, it depletes your muscle movement. I couldn't hold a pen. I couldn't hold a pen to even write my name. So that, that's where the rehab part came in. I had to learn how to do all of this all over again. I had to build my muscles. But I was so afraid of leaving the hospital and going to one of my children's houses. Now, Alexis was like, no, you coming to my house. I said, I'm not coming to your house with you and Chandler. I'm not doing that. Because if I'm still contagious, I'm not going to give this to you. Mom, you coming to my house. So I got one for you. I'm going to do 14 days in this hospital. I'm going to do my quarantine in the hospital. I got to stay in this room anyway. Let me just stay here. Then 
because I had to go to rehab, that was another additional week. Um, then I said, okay, now I need to do an additional seven days here because I want to make sure I need 14 and 14. Henceforth, that was the length. I was demanding that, no, I need to know. <laughs> I need to know for, for real, for real. And even when I got to Lexi's house, she'll tell you, <laughs> I didn't leave the room. I stayed in the room, afraid, don't touch me. I, I, you know, don't touch that. Don't sit on my bed. Don't, you know, just, I, you know, move, I had her move everything out of the room. I got an air mattress. I got everything that I needed, and she doesn't even know this. I used one fork, one spoon, and one cup. And she's missing that one fork, that one spoon, and that one cup because when I got ready to leave her house, I threw it in the garbage. <laughs> you know what? I don't blame you, <laughs> blame you because uh, there's some individuals who actually had uh, tested positive for it. Now, there's one as severe as yours where they had to stay in the hospital for, you know, days or whatever, and then rehab after that. But they were in the house, and because this thing, it'll wreak havoc on your, on your, on, on your mind, on you psychologically. Yeah. So, I, I want to I talk about this. Yeah. About that but I can, I can understand. I'm saying that to say I can understand why you were like, don't touch this. Get this out. Let me only use this, you know, because you're trying to be uh, conscious of your family. You know, you don't want anybody to live yeah. what you just lived through, you know, or worse, you know. So I'm sure that was all in your mind yeah. as a mom, you know. So I can I can fully understand that. Um, now we're going to get to talking about that psychological part. Let me let me read a, a few more um, on here. Alexis joined us. Hey, Alexis, thanks for watching. We heard about you, our fighter. <laughs> Aisha is on and Jamone. Hey, Tracy, thanks for watching. Apostle says both of your children are very strong. I, and I, yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. Um, Dr. Regina says you, you got a story to tell a lot. Some things that I've been through, but you're healed. Oh, okay. Well, praise God, Dr. Regina. Yeah, let me tell you about her. She will call me. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I just got to say this. Uh, Dr. Regina and I have been knowing each other since I can't even remember how old I was. That's how long we've been knowing each other. That's, that's my sister, okay? And she doesn't even know. She would call me on days that I couldn't talk. She would just call me. She would pray, and she did it every day. She never missed a day that I was at the hospital until I could talk back to her. I knew what she was doing. I knew, she didn't know that I knew she was doing what she was doing, but I knew what she was doing. She would call me and say, hey, and if I would give her a, because sometimes that was all I could say was, she'd say, okay, okay, I just was calling you to check on you, and she'd hang up. Up until like around the, the day before I got ready to get out of the hospital, I had full conversation for her. My aunt, the same way, my aunt made me, no, it was my daughter-in-law that made me get this duo on my phone, the old phone. Henceforth, my kids that got me this iPhone that I know nothing about, but <laughs> made me get duo on my phone. So my aunt videoed me. She had to see me. You know, I pay, you can't talk, but I need to see you. My sister-in-law and my brother-in-law, they, you know, we, we got this thing, it's a seal. Sister-in-law, brother-in-law, Daryl's, Daryl's brother and his, his younger brother and, and his wife, they are beasts when it comes to reaching out to others and keeping stuff together and 
you know, uh, Daryl's mom and dad were in a tizzy. Both of us is at the hospital. We don't know because she can't come to the hospital. They don't know what's going on. They're keeping Lexi sane and, you know, keeping the parents sane and, and giving reports back. Kim would text me every morning until she would call me every morning. Uh, how's it going? How you doing? How you feeling? Can you talk? Do you feel like talking? So I, the team, my team, so I'll call the center, my team, <laughs> you know, yeah, that, them the strong ones. I, I, they carried us. They carried us. And, and, and I, I'm so, I'm so, oh, I can't thank them enough for that. They carried us. <laughs> yeah, I see some here. Let me see. Oh, Dr. Regina said, we prayed our way through this. Whew. Ah. You know, I, I know you were going to make me, I'm the host. I know she's going to make me in tears. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's all right. Buddy, I see you. Dr. Hill says, unfortunately, there were a lot of children and teens that had to care for their parents alone. And you know what? It's something you should actually say that, Dr. Hill, and then to hear uh, your, your testimony, Prophetess, because I wasn't even thinking in that respect. You know what I mean? Yeah. This this virus, this pandemic, it has wreaked havoc. And what did you, what, what, how did you describe it in the beginning? You said it's of the devil, you know, and it's yeah. <laughs> amazing how it has affected so many different people in so many different ways. I wasn't even thinking about, you know, the children that had to make decisions for their parents, like in your, yeah. in your situation. It just brought me back. It brought me back to when my mom, I cared for my mom before she died. Mm -hmm. And it brought me back to, I'm an only child. I have no sisters and brothers. So I had to make decisions that almost 50 years old at the time she passed, I'm still not big enough for this. I'm not old enough for this. I don't want to make these decisions. You know, I will call my aunt and say, no, I just, I, I can't make the decision. And she says, you know, niece, you got to make the call. And because I was fighting so for my mom, I'm like, no, I'm not going to make that call. Of course not. You you going to put them paddles on her until she, she breathes again. I'm not helping you sign no papers telling me no resuscitation is the devil. You, <laughs> you know, I was ready to fight with that <laughs> about my mom. So just thinking back, now they, they're doing the same thing for me. They have to do the same thing. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was on the phone about your mom because that's how I was when my mom was ready to, to <laughs> make her decision. I was like, uh uh, keep the machine on, huh? No, uh uh. As long as it ain't nothing but electricity, her insurance paying for it. <laughs> you crazy. <laughs> Trust me, I have two other sisters, right? And I was the last one that was holding out. I literally had to, we were at the hospital and they were like, okay, you gotta make a decision because they need to, I'm like, leave her on there. What, what, what are we talking about? Hello? You know, I was holding out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Somebody had I, I, We know God. God could turn this around at the last minute. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> And not that. even realizing that she was ready to go. She had told my told my aunt, I'm sick of this. <laughs> she had told my aunt, I'm sick of this. I'm ready to go. Now, of course, if my aunt would have said that to me, I would have had an excuse for that. Oh, she's not talking to her right now. She ain't ready to go nowhere. She's going to stay here forever. I don't care. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Well, I, I think that your children are fighters and that they are very, very strong. And um, one of the things that I, I kept remembering um, that I heard a couple of times was that your son was really your advocate when he was telling them to make sure that they pump you with that vitamin C. I saw you make yeah. talk about it, you know, before. And I'm like, wow, you know, that now that in itself is amazing to me. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes the doctors, they were like, um, I'm the doctor, let me do this or whatever. Yeah, like the doctor came to the room. 
<laughs> and said that. They said, he said that. Um, who, do you know a Ryan McGee? I said, yeah. I said, is he here? He says, no, but he's very, very adamant about us giving you vitamin C in an IV. Now, Ryan is like a health guru. Uh, he don't eat pork, you know, that whole Asalaamu uh, Alaikum thing, you know what I'm saying. Anywho, <laughs> he's not of that religion, thank you, Jesus, but he follows a lot of their, their ways of what they, you know, they put in their body. And <laughs> He was so adamant about that. And when I see I was coming back back around, you know, the fever had broke. Then now, okay, my my uh, I call her my evangelist heal. <laughs> my evangelist Shirley Hill's teachings came back. And I said, Okay, this is attacking my immune system. I have to attack it back. And just a plug out there for anybody. You know, and I know she talks about it. Listen to her. Uh, my teachings on what she's taught about, he, the things that heal the body, the foods that heal the body, the foods that kill the body, and, and the various teachings under Dr. Hun and, and Apostle Dion about fasting and, and consecrating your body. I shut everything down at the hospital. I, I said, don't bring me. Now, you're dealing with a, a, a virus, your lungs is full of mucus, but you're, you're sending me chicken alfredo to eat. Cream-based soups, cream-based foods, they don't know. They don't know, and I couldn't fault them. They're just trying to get me, get me some food in me to get me up and moving around, but you, I'm not breathing. So I said, okay. Oranges, natural vitamin C, uh, pineapples, inflammatory deterrent, because my lungs are inflamed. I said, okay, I don't want you bringing me nothing else to eat, no food. For two weeks, Annette, for two weeks, 10 days, more probably longer than that. For three days, three meals, my three meals a day consisted of a plate of oranges, a plate of pineapple. Honeydew melon, cantaloupe, warm water, green tea, lemons, honey. I laid that, and that's probably the reason why I couldn't walk. I had no muscle movement. But I tell you this, it flushed my body, and I started breathing. When I left the hospital, I didn't need the inhaler. I never needed an inhaler. I was on that abutyrol pump at least four times a day, just trying to breathe. I had to, I had to fight. My body had to fight. The dietician then comes up and says to me, because now they bring the foods in to you, whatever you don't eat, they have to throw it away. This insure they were giving me, this clear insure, the first three ingredients in it is sugar. That's going to tear my immune system down. Are you serious? You trying to kill me or are you trying to get me well? What, what, do you, I mean, what are we doing really? So they leave and they say, okay, you want to take this with you? I said, no, let's stay in there. By the time I got ready to leave the, leave the hospital, I had about four cases of just the Sure Clear. I wasn't drinking that. <laughs> you know, people ain't trying to kill me. <laughs> you won't say I'm a COVID victim. I was <laughs> like, no, I need you to listen to me. I made, got a rapport with the nurses. I had nurses bringing me my green tea. I had them bringing me whole lemons. I had them bringing me uh, organic honey. Wow. So I'm grateful. I had a team in, the, some was a team in the hospital. But yeah, yeah, you got to watch what you eat. You got to watch what you ingest. And I, you know, and I said this to Apostle, I said, you know, I kind of brought, probably brought this on myself. I said, because I had got back into this rut, I was caring for the loved one. I wasn't eating properly. Between the business and there, I'm leaving. So the drive-thrus became my friend. 
McDonald's sweet tea because I stopped drinking coffee, sugar rush, tear my immune system down. I'm eating all this just junk fatty foods and stuff like that. I made my immune system just wide open and said, welcome to whatever you want to give me. I'm here. Just come get me. And it got me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here because even though I'm allowing um, the Lord allowed me to have this platform for you all to tell your journey about your journey I wanted people to learn and understand too you know because we what I'm hearing is that you have to take charge you know yep. of your body so of course you prepare your body you, you do whatever you can so that you won't get it but if you do get it you know I'm grateful again I keep going back to your son I'm grateful you know, and then as you started coming back this way, you were like, okay, this is what I need, da, 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 da. So you took charge and mm -hmm. what's going to have to happen. Don't just lay down there and die, you know? No. Like you said, you reached back on the things that you were taught, even with Evangelist Hill. You know, you were yes. on there. And I'm telling y'all, this is a little side note. Every fourth Wednesday here on My Body and Soul, Dr. Hill is here and she's informing us of what we need to do with our bodies. Do not tune her out. And aside from mind, body, and soul, you can catch her doing her, her Facebook lives. Yeah. It's not holding back on any information she is informing us. We got to take our health back. We got to do it, guys. We got to do it. And this is a prime example of what we, um, our Prophet Rolanda's situation is a prime example. Um, th this, is, this is deep. Apostle Hunt says you were teaching them how to care for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're trying to kill me, Apostle. <laughs> <laughs> the dietitian should know you, but you have to be your own advocate. So this this is good, good stuff. So I don't know if anybody is dealing with uh, COVID on today. If you know anybody that's dealing with COVID, I mean, listen to these tag them in this this uh, this live feed on today. I have another guest that's going to come up shortly, but Prophetess Rolanda has has um, she has shared with us. I told you you're going to be all right, didn't I? No, didn't yeah, tell you. yeah. <laughs> You look like, uh, and I don't know what, what baseball player used to say this. He said, let's play two. You look like you're ready to go for, for another round. <laughs> you look like you're ready to go for another round. But I am so grateful that you have taken time to share uh, your journey with us on today. Um, you, you were in the hospital from March until May. And you were actually, when you went in, those were the early stages of like doctors and, and medical mm -hmm. kind of figuring stuff out. So you were kind of like in that, almost like in that testing phase there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Learning, though, but you, you were early on there. So I'm, I'm grateful to God that he, uh, that he blessed you prophetess. I really am. I'm, I, I truly am. My heart would have been hurt if I had heard something otherwise, but, and I'm grateful yeah. also for your husband as well. So yeah, as we as we wrap up and and he he's doing good too your husband he is um because he didn't i you know and i say this because i couldn't be advocate for you uh when they they started eating when he started eating that's when i kind of took over uh with his nurse i said no don't give him any cream based anything you know but by him being intubated he was in a self-induced coma. So he didn't have uh, the whereabouts or the means to put the foods in his body that can clear up, you know, his lungs and clear up the mucus and, and all of that. So he still has, you know, respiratory issues. He still has respiratory issues. Uh, we're getting there, you know, we're getting there. And it's 90 degree weather, uh, makes you tend to want to drink colder liquids. Uh, I kind of forced him into drinking at least two hot teas with me, one at night, one in the morning. You know, I still do it, you know, just to keep my lungs clear. Right. Um, just jumping back to that, um, the mental state. I think I've, I've developed anxiety. Mm -hmm. It makes you, it makes you, it, it, I have anxiety attacks now. Because sometimes I'll think about, you know, uh, <laughs> it's just put, I'm about to put Lexi on blast. She picked up this extra job. And she don't know. I'm, she made me so mad. I'm so happy today she quitting. Because she's trying to 
myself out there in a public in, in a public setting, you know, although, you know, she's taking all the precautions. She knows, I mean, it's, it's a rhythm we have. No shoes in the house. Uh, when you get in the house, you take your clothes off. Turn them inside out. Turn them inside out. You touch nothing until you hit the bathroom. Take a shower if, if you've been out all day. I mean, wash your face, you know, head to toe. You're touching nothing. And it's a whole mental thing. She don't know. All while she was at that other job, my heart is racing because I'm going, oh, my God. What if somebody coughs on her clothes and she takes it to the car and Chandler gets a hold to this? And, and you know, it's a whole, it's a step process. And it, it'll make you think that you, you've contracted it all over again because anxiety, it, it, it affects your breathing. So now I'm wheezing. I, I'm like, okay, now I got to find in hell. And then I have to go back and say, the devil, I made my doctor test me again. I done had so many tests. I'm the one using up all the tests from everybody. Because I made him test me again. I made him test me again. And got my results. You still negative. You yet still have antibodies. We're not testing you no more, so don't ask me. <laughs> you know, and not realizing it was anxiety. I still have anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm so I'll be so happy when God say, okay, we y'all, we, we, oh better yet, not even when God say we get ourselves together, so God can say, I'm putting my hands on this, I'm releasing it off of it. Yeah, because He got to put His hands on this. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. You know what? You explained that very well about the psychological part because I, I can see that. I can understand. You know, if you've been in a situation like uh, like you were in, like your husband was in, um, it can have, you know, some kind of effects. You know, mm -hmm. doing all those tests, you know, constantly testing yourself kind of helps to alleviate, you know, a little bit in your mind. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I get it. I totally understand. I really do. But Prophet Rolanda, oh my goodness, thank you so, so much. No, thank you. <laughs> You're back at work. I, I, I want you to pace yourself. <laughs> I am. And now I'm looking like the nurses. I'm all in a hazmat suit doing my clients. <laughs> I don't care because you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know. Someone asked a question on the, on the live feed earlier about um, reinfection. Does anybody know about, you know, are you able to be reinfected? or not, because that, that's my question. I, I want to know, because I know so many have been infected, but they've been healed of it. But, you know, I and then sometimes when you hear that question, like on, I think it's GMA, they'll ask some of the doctors a the question. They're like, well, everything is still, we don't know exactly yet. They don't know. They don't know. They don't. So you just do all you can to protect yourself and your loved ones. And mm -hmm. I appreciate what you're doing uh, to do that. So again, thank you again. Um, my love to your husband, your family, Alexis, uh, your son and, and daughter-in-law. Thank you. Those that were um, there for your whole team, your team inside and out, as you say. So yeah. I'm really grateful that you are still here and you look wonderful. You look great. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> But thanks again. So as we and we're gonna segue, guys. I don't want anybody to to don't go anywhere. We have another guest that we're gonna bring on, and um, yeah, she was an amazing guest, Brandy. I agree. I agree. Um, I may have to get you to come back. We have to get you to come back and 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 and, and talk a little bit more. Uh, I know you mentioned about another um, individual that you know very well that the Lord blessed them to come out of it as well. Yeah, my landlord. Yes, yes. Well, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm grateful. I don't even know. Ninety years old. Ninety. Wow. He's ninety years old. See there, God is still blessing. He's still yeah. blessing. And he can, he can bring us out of this if we do what we need to do and put our trust and hope and faith in Him. So again, prophets. All right, I'm gonna get out of here. Uh, get okay. You. <laughs> big kisses, smooches, big hugs to you. I love you so much. I love you too. All right. You take care of yourself. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, guys, my, my listeners, my viewers, uh, I appreciate all of you on today. We're going to, I'm going to actually.
today and admit my next guest. You know, this is a little different that we're doing here since we are uh, doing everything virtually, but I have my second guest uh, that we are going to present today. Uh, if you look on the screen, you will see a gorgeous, a gorgeous woman of God. Listen, let me say this <laughs> real quick. I'm great to throw in something. I think your dad and your mom are watching, but uh -huh. uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Woodard, and Lady Beverly, you all have some beautiful children. I just want you to know that. Oh, beautiful, thank you. Beautiful, <laughs> young man, beautiful young lady. And then I'm looking at them grandkids too. Just absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful. Oh, people. thank you so much. I just want to throw that out there. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing good. Good. Good, good. Hey guys, so I have my second guest on, Jasmine uh, Woodard Jones. She hyphenates on Facebook. I'm going to read a little bit of her bio because she's going to yes. talk to us about her uh, experience with COVID. Um, yeah. She is a wife. She is a mother of four, four now, my yes. God, <laughs> at a registered nurse. She's a registered yes. nurse from Indianapolis, Indiana. She is married to Jonathan Jones. Yes. His children are Jackson, Lavender, Hezekiah, and please pronounce the last the last one for me. Nevea. Nevea. I didn't want to butcher it. I have a fear about butchering names. Nevea. And that's heaven backwards. Yes. And I gave her that name because she came out breach. She came out feet first. Wow. So it's heaven backwards. There you go. Makes sense to me. <laughs> Um, so it says here that her family is the most important thing to her. Yes. She's been a nurse for four years yes. and currently works on a medical surgical floor. Yes. She enjoys her career and believes wholeheartedly that becoming a nurse was her purpose. Yes. Jasmine is also the founder and creator of Pretty Practice, mm -hmm. which was created to unite women in healthcare. I love yes. it. I love yes. it. It says their goal is to inspire, empower, uplift, and mentor one another in and out of their professional lives. Pretty practice bridges the gap for women in healthcare that come from all different walks of life. They promote mm -hmm. diversity, self-care, furthering education, and they're also a catalyst for networking and encouraging others to be there for one another. Yes. We want to ensure all women, regardless of race and ethnicity, that they're supported through this organization. Her motto, I like this, when you look good, you feel good, and you do good. <laughs> That's right. She believes the care you give to yourself is just as important as the care um, that they give their patients. Her mission in life is driven by the love and the service that she humbly gives to God and serving his people. Welcome again to Mind, Body, and Soul, Jasmine Woodard. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. I am so glad. Um, you're actually, when I initially thought, uh, there were two people when, when the Lord gave me to do this segment. That mm -hmm. I, um, Rolanda, the um, prophetess that I just had on. And someone else mentioned your name to me. And I said, oh my God, that's right. Because I had heard about your situation. Yes. So that's why you two are, are kind of kicking this off for Mind, Body, and Soul. Good. We, we want to jump right in if we can, because um, we all know that you know an hour can go by so fast. Yes. We'll jump right in and talk to you um, about your journey with dealing with um, being positive for COVID. Um, and, and how it affected you. And then, of course, you share with my listeners the mm -hmm. state that you were in when you were diagnosed <laughs> with, uh, with being uh, positive with, with COVID-19. Right. So let me just start off by saying um, it is a blessing to be here, and it certainly was an experience um, going through that. I have never experienced anything like that in my life. Um, I kind of teased my family because back in 2016, when I first became a nurse, that year was really pivotal in my life because I became a nurse, a mom, a wife, all that in one year and started a new job as a nurse. But dealing with this here in 2020 has really transformed 
my life and really my outlook on life and what I think about, you know, others being in the field of healthcare. So <laughs> 2016 was um, a big year for me, but I think this year has been even bigger. Um, going through that experience, having the COVID and pregnant with twins. When I found out, um, it was March 18th, that day I was at work. I was working on not my normal floor, but I had floated to a different floor. And mid shift, I work a 12 hour shift, um, but in the middle of the shift, I just all of a sudden fell ill. Um, I started having chills. Um, I had a little bit of a cough. Um, and I just, you know, I'm like, maybe it's the pregnancy. Maybe I've overworked myself today and I just need to go home and rest. I talked to the supervisor who was there and I said, hey, I'm not feeling well. I'm not re really sure, you know, what's going on. But she said, you know, with these new regulations of COVID, you need to go home right away. We can't keep you here. And I said, okay, I'll just, you know, go home, rest, sleep it off and come back to work tomorrow. Um, but when I got home, my symptoms started to gradually get worse. And it was just kind of unexplainable. I, I really thought I had the flu. I'm like, maybe I've calmed down with the flu um, because I had those flu-like symptoms. But that night, which was um, a Wednesday, um, I just was like, oh my goodness, you know, something's wrong, something is off. Um, I, when I went home, my mom was here with my kids and she was saying, you know, the kids have fevers as well. And I said, what? I said, oh, I've given them something, you know, and I felt awful. Um, but like I said, that night, I tried to rest, sleep it off. When I got up Thursday, I said something is not right. I was having, you know, shortness of breath. I was sweating. Um, I had lost taste and sense of smell. Something was really going on. I said, you know, mom, with me being pregnant, I should probably go to the ER if I'm not better by the end of the day. So Friday, I went to um, the ER and they said, you know, with the COVID regulations, we're going to have to isolate you. You know, what are you feeling? And I said, I'm just, you know, feeling sick. But with me being pregnant, I felt urgent enough to come to the ER. And I said, I'm also a nurse. And they said, oh, you're a nurse? So they're like, well, we need to test you for the COVID. And I'm like, there's no way I have the COVID, but I understand policy, you know, go ahead. And so sure enough, they gave me the swab, the God awful swab. <laughs> oh my gosh, that swab is brutal. And two days later, which was Sunday morning, they called me first thing around 6 a.m. And they told me, you know, you're positive for COVID-19. And I said, there's no way. Initially, I had just started crying. I was in bed with my husband and he was like, you know, it's going to be okay. And I said, I've given, you know, all of you all the COVID. That's why we're all sick. So um, I was crying and crying and crying. And then I called my parents and I was like, I tested positive for, for COVID. And they were just, just as in shock as I was. I mean, we were pretty, you know, in shock, like, oh my gosh, you know, you have the COVID. Um, because at that time it was still new. I was actually one of the first few cases here in Indiana. So it was pretty scary because my symptoms were getting worse. I wasn't getting better when I found out. And I'm like, I don't know what it's going to look like for me in the next few days to come. Um, but, you know, thankfully I had my mom who was, uh, who just, you know, really stepped right in and became all of our caregivers. So, yeah. but... <laughs> Now, let me ask you, now, how far along were you when this happened? When I found out I was 28 weeks pregnant with the twins. Okay, all right. And so you're thinking you gave everybody else. Now, was your husband exhibiting any kind of symptoms? He what? did, a couple days after I did. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Woo, all right. So now... Did you go to your hospital when you went to go in? Because you said you weren't, about, if you weren't feeling good by a certain time, you were going to go and get checked out. No, I did not. No, I went to a different hospital. Okay. Okay. Wow. 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 Okay. And so yeah. tell me, oh, so somebody says that swab is the devil. 
No, the swab is the devil. I've been swabbed three times now. It's awful. It's awful. I cried every time. What is that the one where they, is it the nose or the? It's, I had the nasal swab. I, I believe there's an oral swab now, but I had the nasal swab and it is awful. Never felt anything like that. Oh my God. Oh my God. And so I can imagine being 28 weeks along, you know, because you're already, you know, when you're expecting, you're already conscious of your child. You want everything to go well. You don't be looking for anything, you know, outside of right. you're going to go through these nine months and have this baby, you know. So I can only imagine what that was, you know, doing to you, you know, psychologically. I'm caring for, I'm caring for twins and I have two other ones here as well. Oh, right, exactly. So, um, you mentioned your mom. And her hopping in like Superwoman. And uh, she is. She <laughs> is Superwoman. <laughs> I, I would see her on her live feeds, and every once in a while, you know, she'll she'll do her her encouragements, but then she'll yes. pray for Jasmine, pray for the babies, you know. And I'm like, oh God, please. So I can I can only imagine what that was like. Um, during the time when COVID really came out, well, when we were um, told about it. I have a niece who was, she was expecting, and she actually had a dream. I hope I'm not telling too much of her business, but she had had a dream <laughs> that she had um, tested positive. And then, now she also has a daughter as well, and she dreamt that, her, that, that the daughter tested positive. So we had been praying and everything, and thank God she didn't get it. You know, she delivered the baby. Yeah. It's been a month, a bit a month now. So she didn't yeah. get anything. So it was in that, uh, I was thinking, you know, I can only imagine how those who are expecting are feeling during this whole time of this pandemic. You know, I can I can just imagine carrying a child during this time. What that would what that would do to you? So yeah. What what were um your, your your thoughts and everything? What all you had to go through after you found out that you had tested positive? Right. So when I found out, we were, we were um, pretty much, well, I was one of the first cases here in Indiana. Like I said, they were really only testing healthcare workers at that time. So when I found out that I had it, um, it really took us all by surprise. And it was kind of like, okay, what do we do? Because there's still a lot of unknown about the virus. We don't know, you know, it, the transmission or you know, who does it, who can it kill, who can it affect the most? So we really didn't know a lot about it. We just kind of saw and heard about it on the news. And, you know, we were taking the necessary precautions at the hospital, um, like screening people when they first come in. But other than that, we weren't really too concerned because, you know, we were told don't be concerned. Um, but so when I found out that I had it, it was just like, Oh my goodness, um, we, we need to do something. My mom, she was doing her best, you know, doing research, kind of staying up to date with what the CDC was recommending as far as care. Um, but really all they told us to do was quarantine, you know, for those 14 days, um, which we did. We were so sick, you know, we couldn't do much else. Um, but for those 14 days, we quarantined, um, but it took me actually a good month to feel better. Even now, I still don't have my taste and my sense of smell, um, but it took a good month to really recover and feel some type of normalcy. But I was also pregnant, so I wasn't gonna get too much better because <laughs> I had these twins on board. Um, and I know another concern of mine was my daughter. Earlier that month, I had found out that she had heterotaxy syndrome. And with me having the COVID, I didn't know how that would affect both babies, but specifically her. You know, um, what does that look like? You know, is this transmitted from mother to baby? So that was, that was pretty scary um, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, my concern was really just my my the health of my babies. I knew in my heart that I was going to be okay. I firm believer in the, that the Lord was going to bring me and all of my family members through it. But my concern was the babies. They 
pretty much scared me. <laughs> the doctors did when they said that with me having this um, virus that it could mean she could come out, you know, stillbirth. I mean, they were saying all kinds of crazy things. So my concern was really the babies. I wasn't wor really worried about myself. It was hard dealing with it. It was hard on the body, um, not being able to eat, smell, just not feeling well. I wasn't able to get out of bed for about nine days. So um, it, it was it was pretty scary. But my real concern was my babies. What does this mean for them? What are they going to look like, you know, when they come out? So I really was holding my breath <laughs> up until I gave birth to them. And when I saw them alive, breathing, that just meant the world to me. You know, I knew God was right there at that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, how were, now what were you eating during that time? Um, Nothing. <laughs> really? My, me and my mother, oh, we bumped heads multiple times. She was like, Jasmine, you have to eat, you're pregnant. I just couldn't. It was like a metal taste in my mouth. I could not eat. I could not drink. It was, it was awful. It was awful. I don't wish that on anyone. Okay. All right. Well, I'm sure with the insistence of your mother, she got something in you. <laughs> At some point. Oh yeah, she. <laughs> um, yeah, she did her best, but we we were going at. It. I said, "Mom, I can't do it." She was like, "You know, you have to." She was like, "I'm not thinking about you. I'm thinking about my grandbabies." <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> like, well, what about me? <laughs> right. So this is not about you. You have those babies to think about. I get it. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Let me read some comments from uh, Facebook Live because this is okay. really interesting. Uh, let's see. Oh my goodness. I think they're talking about, oh, that, yeah, the nasal swab. Demetra says it feels like they are trying to take your eyes out through your nose. Oh, yeah, it's awful. And somebody responded, Robert responded, says, exactly. It brought tears to my eyes. I had to sit for a while before I even stood up. You know, I can just only imagine. And then you, you extra, you had two human beings on the inside of you going through that. My God. Yeah. So the last time I was actually swabbed, the third time I was in labor, I was eight centimeters dilated and contracting every two minutes when they swabbed me at the hospital. Oh, I, I think said, you have to do this right now. Like right now, I'm getting ready to have these babies and you're getting ready to swab me. They were like, it's protocol and you've had the virus. And I said, you know what, fine, go ahead. Okay, I think I just felt that. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that is deep. Yes. Um, now, I do want to ask you about, okay, so now by the time you delivered, were you still, you, I mean, I know they, they took that last uh, swab. Yes. But what, what did that come back as? It came back as negative. And thank God, because I was allowed to have my husband there when I delivered. Thanks, God. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I know that's a, that's also been another concern for expected mothers wanting, yeah. to, um, you know, significant other spouses or whatever to be in the room with them. And I know that some some hospitals weren't allowing that. Correct. I'm, I'm grateful that he was able to be in there with you as well. Uh, Brandy says here, oh, my God, it's one thing to worry about your own life, but to be going through this and have to be concerned about your unborn child. She said she is a warrior. And I I second that motion. <laughs> Uh, let's see, other comments here. Liana says, Sister Beverly Woodard uh, was definitely being a nurse for everyone. Oh God, yeah. God was with you while you were helping your families uh, and that's love. And your mom says here, Dr. Shirley Hill really gave me insight on how to care for my family. Yeah. You know, I, it, it's beautiful to hear, hear that because you know, you can you, use your resources. You know, individuals like, I wait, I lean heavily on Dr. Hill. <laughs> yes. So does my mother. <laughs> exactly. And so knowing that and you know, understanding, you know, this is how the Lord can help you to get through different things and hey, take advantage of it. Um, Eric, I see you on. Um, Alexis is still watching. Thank you so much. Uh, and there are others, and I'm so sorry if I didn't get a chance to call your name. Is it Mika Kincaid? I think that's okay. Uh, thank you for watching. Vanessa, I see you on. And Tamara, I probably should be putting my other eyes on to help me out with this. Uh, let's see here. That's my daughter's middle name. Okay. Oh, maybe it's your, maybe your middle name is our daughter's middle name. 
You guys, I'm scrolling back up. And so there are some, some comments that I actually have kind of missed. So I'm just trying to go through them real quick. Uh, I did see Dr. Woodard is on. Thank you so much, sir, for watching and supporting us on today. And I see Rolanda, the previous guest, is on watching as well. So if you guys have any questions for our, our second guest here, you can, you can throw them in the, in the comments section. Um, and I do appreciate all your comments that you uh, are giving on today. Demetra says here, Dr. Shirley Hill was a blessing for us all during that time. And she said, if not for her, then she would still have that fever. And I know that there are some of you that dealt with COVID um, yourself. Some of you were asymptomatic. Some of you did not um, deal with uh, being laid up in the hospital for so long or what have you, but you still dealt with the, the positive um, result of having COVID. And, you know, I, I, I thought your story was very different, very unique, Jasmine. And I think, am I not, if I'm not mistaken, you, do you, you have a YouTube channel where you kind of talked about your journey? Yes, yes. Okay. yes, I do. Okay, um, maybe kind of tell us a little bit about that because um, I, I'm sure over there that you've helped some individuals out, whether they are expecting or their loved ones are expecting, um, even in how, how to deal with, you know, the COVID. Um, and you're a nurse, you know, so maybe you can also give us some tips as well on what, what we need to, um, you know, look out for, be careful of, because as I st stated in the earlier segment, COVID hasn't gone anywhere. It's still here. Um, and I, I think people think because the summer is here, the weather is nice, uh, it's not that bad. Um, so maybe start with your YouTube channel, talk to us about that, and then kind of maybe from a nurse's perspective, mm -hmm. you know, uh, your story and then what we need to watch out for ourselves. Okay. Yeah. So my YouTube channel, um, I haven't been consistent with it. I'll say that up until now, where I think it's very important that I share my story. I'm always asked these questions about, you know, my life, being a mother, being a wife, having four children, being a nurse, how to balance it all. So I said, you know what? This year, I am going to dedicate myself to YouTube so I can answer all these questions on this platform and really be an inspiration to other young mothers, um, nurses. I think I um, cater to a lot of different um, women. I have a lot to offer. So I thought, you know, YouTube would be the best way to do that. And actually, you know, get a... Um, I actually find joy in doing that. It's kind of a, a release, um, just kind of being natural in front of the camera and talking and sharing my life with others. I don't hide it. I think it's a blessing to be where I am, being that I am a nurse, a wife and a mom, and I wanna share that with others. So that's really why you know, I got into the YouTube and um, I'm consistent with it now. So definitely check me out on YouTube. My name is Jasmine Marie. I actually just uploaded a couple of videos um, a couple of days ago. So please do follow me there on YouTube. Um, but yeah, my story doesn't end here. I'll say that COVID-19 hasn't gone anywhere. I do see a lot of people living their best life because, you know, it is the summertime, but COVID hasn't gone anywhere. And I hope the public really takes the virus serious so we really can get the virus under control and stop the spread. They did say that there is supposed to be a second wave come the fall and our hospital, from what I'm being told, is preparing for that second wave. So please, you know, be mindful of where you are and what you're doing. If you can stay home, then stay home. We don't have a vaccine yet. So transmission is, you know, I mean, it's real. You know, you have to be mindful of washing your hands. If you have a mask, wear a mask. People think it's silly. Um, the mask is not necessarily to stop you from getting the COVID, but it will help you from giving it to you know someone else because there are those who are asymptomatic. And I think my mother was asymptomatic. Our entire family had it. And the fact that she didn't experience one symptom is God. But you know, maybe you know, there's a possibility that she did have it and she was just asymptomatic. We don't know the true transmission of the virus. So please be mindful of where you are, what you're doing. Keep washing your hands wherever you are and wear a mask if you can. 
you know, for me, I'm, I do have my four little ones. I have to go back to work shortly in a couple of weeks here. So, you know, like I said, my story doesn't end here. I still have to go back onto the front line um, and work and serve, you know, these people. So do it for me <laughs> and, you know, be safe, stay home and, you know, follow the regulations that the CDC gives. Yeah. And that, that's good. That's very good advice, especially from your, your profession um, in, in your professional level. Now, uh, quick question. I don't know if we uh, asked this or not, but you had, been, you had been still working before you found out you were uh, tested positive, right? How long? Yes. Okay. So you were still on the, you were basically still on the front lines. Yes. Okay. All right. And yeah, I worked up until with my first two children, I worked that Wednesday and all my children were born on Thursday, surprisingly, but I worked up until, um, and that was my plan, even though I was having twins was to work up until, but when I found out that I had the COVID, there was just no way I became so weak. Um, I even became anemic. I needed iron transfusion and I also developed gestational diabetes which I didn't experience with my first two pregnancies. I'm not saying that the COVID caused it, but my OBGYN did let me know that there's a high chance that because I had the COVID, I developed um, these other two issues. Okay. So there were other things that were going on. Well, yeah, right. this, is, this is something you have a lot to deal with. Um, guys, I hope you're listening to her. She's telling us what to do. Um, you know, with our bodies and making sure we wear those masks. I just did a YouTube uh, video. I said, I know y'all don't want to wear these masks, but put them on, put them on. Yeah. Think of it like it's an investment, like you're making a payment on your car. You, it's an investment. You right. have to ensure that you and your loved ones are, you know, taken care of. And so it is with the mask. That's why I said, look, look at it like that. I know, you know, it's kind of inconvenient. You don't want to do it, but it, it, it's a must, it really is. And I, I think some people kind of go to the extreme. They feel that if somebody's constantly telling me to wear a mask that I'm not in control of my own body. Well, don't oh, do no. that. <laughs> That's a selfish way to think. It's, it's, not about, it's not about you, it's about someone else. And you know, just think about if it was your grandmother, your grandfather, or you know, a loved one or a friend in that position. I've heard the stories. I haven't been there because again, I've been off work, but I've heard stories from other nurses say it's, it's a sad thing to see these people dying from the COVID, having no one at their bedside because they can't have any visitors. Um, you know, unexpectedly coming down with this virus, being admitted, the whole process from coming in to them dying, it's awful. And so, you know, you just have to think about, step outside of yourself and think about someone else. I love it. You, you said a word there, you really did. Um, okay, there was a question that was on the floor. Tamara says, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, as a nurse, will you have to care for COVID-19 patients again? Or did you? So since I've been off work, I now have a new manager I now have a new schedule and I'm being placed on another floor. There has been drastic changes at my hospital since I've been off work. So when I return to work, I will be in an area where COVID patients will be. So yes. Okay, do you have any concerns about that yourself? I do. Just because there's still a lot of unknown. We don't know everything about COVID-19. They first came out and said, you know, it only affects the elderly, but we've seen firsthand young, old, middle-aged have died from the virus. So just like you can catch the flu again, I'm sure you can catch COVID-19 again. So yeah, there is a big concern with me going back. Um, my mother's concerned. My entire family is truly concerned. Um, so we're definitely going to have to implement some type of schedule or routine, something here in my household for what we're going to do and what it should look like when I go to work and come home. Right. So there, there is, there's a big concern, which is why I'm saying, you know, as a nurse, please wash your hands, wear a mask. If you can stay home, stay home, you know, 
it's it's small but it's important um so it it is it's a big worry but i'm trying to <laughs> Woosa a little bit and you know pray and just have faith that God's going to keep protecting me and protecting my family when I do go back right I mean because it's not like uh, I have seen some um, nurses and doctors or what have you though every once in a while maybe like in Good Morning America they'll highlight different ones who they don't they don't go back home they stay maybe in a hotel or someplace near the hospital because they don't want to bring anything back home to their family, but you can't do that. You got two new babies. <laughs> yeah, and oddly enough, people ask me all the time, you know, what should I do? I always have these women asking me, what should I do when I go home? And I feel awful because when I caught it, it, it took us by surprise. It was just like, they said, you know, did you separate yourself from the, your kids? And I'm like, no, my kids had it. Thankfully, you know, we all recovered, but we all had it. So there was no plan. I couldn't prepare myself or my family as to what to do when we caught it because when we found out, we had all had it. But at that time, right. Wow. Whew, okay, let's see. All right, I think someone asked the question if you're going to return to work. So she answered that already. Yeah. Another question here. Were your older daughter and son affected during the illness of Jess? Yes. yes. She answered that question as well. Again, guys, I'm scrolling up. I'm scrolling up. Yeah, your mom said she was uh, asymptomatic. She made that comment. Okay. Uh, let's see. Another question here. How would Mrs. Woodard advise relatives who are caring for those suffering from COVID? And what measures did you take to stay safe and uninfected? So, um, you <laughs> so my, so my mother? Well, I'm, you know what? I'm assuming, let's see, hang on. Brandy, can you clarify this? If this is for my guest, Jasmine, or uh, her mother, Lady Beverly? Because this question here says, how would you advise relatives who are caring for the, oh, maybe she's she's probably referring to your mother. Um, but if you can clarify that question for me, Brandy, before we go further um, on that. Yeah, it sounds like she is talking to your mother. Like what measures does she take to stay safe and uninfected? Yeah, because I'm sure she could write a book. I mean, she has been, <laughs> she is the little COVID warrior. <laughs> but a lot of what she did came from Dr. Hill. Okay. Yeah. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Um, and your father says, Dr. Woodard says, the second wave has hit Florida already. I think yeah, I heard the virus hasn't gone anywhere. And I, I pray people take it seriously. You know, they don't want to take it serious till it hits close to home. You know, if a family member gets it or they get it, but, you know, take it serious. Um, when I had it, I said to myself, you know, I really see why people are dying from this. This is hard. It's hard on the body. And, you know, with the flu, you know, you start to feel, you start to feel better a few days later. But with that COVID-19, I'm just like, when is this over? At what point do we get to feel better? Right. <laughs> and I couldn't eat, couldn't drink, you know, just the sweating, that God awful headache that wouldn't go away. Um, it, it was an awful experience. Oh, I can only imagine. And again, you had a double whammy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Vanessa says here, I heard that it's airborne, so we all need have to be careful. You know, there is speculation about that. I think I even saw yeah. another report about it being airborne. What do you know about that? Um, it, it, it's like I said, it's speculation is what it is. Um, and it's hard to really say because to see how sick we all were and then my mother walking around here like, I'm fine. It was like something's off, something is wrong. You can definitely tell that this is a man made virus because it's not hitting everyone the same. Some people have the GI issues, some people have the respiratory issues. It just depends on who, and you can't really pinpoint to say it's the elderly, it's the middle age, or it's the young class because every, every age group has died from it. So, to me, it's all speculation. But I do agree that it's probably airborne. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. some degree, yeah. yeah. I can kind of see that as well. Uh, Dr. Hill says here, you must prepare the body before so we can be COVID free. And I, I, I agree with I that. I agree with that. Yeah. And she's actually been teaching a whole lot lately. Actually for the past, it's almost three months. Um, she said we had three months to prepare and she, they were talking about before this next wave comes through uh, to prepare our bodies. Um, so if any of you, and I, I'm doing all kind of uh, shout outs today and, and doing plugs. So you have to go to Dr. Hill's page because she's been really instructing us on what we need to do um, and what goes into our bodies are, is so important. What we consume is so important. So, um, and I know that a lot of people are concerned. They are concerned whether their loved one have had it. And then unfortunately there's some that have lost loved ones to this, you know, to this virus. So yeah. there's so many questions, you know, that, that we all have. So this is, this is, um, Please take heed to what you're hearing on today, guys. Please take heed. We have a, a, a medical professional in the house, a nurse, and um, she's also talking from her own experience on today. Um, Dr. Uh, Lady Beverly says a change of diet as well will help. And Carolyn says here, make sure when one is viewing, oh, she's talking about your YouTube channel to look for Jasmine Marie. Yeah. Oh, they're oh Jasmine Marie are in the end. Is that what your YouTube channel is under? Is it yes, it should pop up Jasmine Marie, but yes, RNBSN. Okay, because she's saying that there are a lot of Jasmine Marie's on YouTube. Oh. They want to make sure Look. that they're in the right one. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Please. Uh, Carol, we appreciate that. Um, so yes, make sure you guys go and check out her YouTube. Um, she's doing great things. Um, uh, Dr. Wood says, build your immune system. You have to play defense and offense to win a game. I like yes. that. I agree. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Buddy says here, I am still amazed at the level of denial in our society about this virus. Me too. Um, he says, I get people want to go back to their normal lives, but that is history. And that that's something to touch on too, Jasmine, because it's almost like what is going to be our normal? I mean, you know what I mean? We, is this our new normal now, if you will? You know, the wearing of masks and the, you know, making sure that we are, uh, well, you should be watching your hands anyway, but, you know, making sure when you're going out that you're not, you know, um, touching anything and, 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 and exposing yourself or your loved ones. What, what do you think about this new normal that we're, that we're in now? I just think, God is, God has pushed us into this place, this uncomfortable place. And he's really trying to get us to open our eyes to him. Um, I don't think we're going to have, um, go back to the way we were. Even with a vaccine, I'm not sure that, you know, we need to stop wearing masks or that we're fully protected because a lot of people are in denial. And unless this vaccine is made um unless we're forced to get this vaccine there is no normal you know i think we're in this place now we have to accept it and it's really god saying you know this is my time to talk this is my time to take you know my rightful place and turn off the tvs you know look to me you know he's closed down everything and i really just think we need to refocus ourselves on him um, because you know he deserves the glory so I don't I don't think you know I think this is just where we are and I think we have to accept it definitely you know keep washing your hands but I think the whole wearing of the mask I think I think that's where we're at um, of course most people aren't going to do it but I think this is just God paving that way to come back he's, he's on his way and i think we need to be ready now you know you know who you sound like right now right you sound <laughs> you sound like your father <laughs> i i think i think we're just here in this it's uncomfortable you know we're we're suffering financially um with the loss of our jobs loss of our businesses um sports has been cut off which, you know, most Americans love. So 
I, I just think we're in this place now. We need to accept it and look at the bigger picture. And for those who aren't Christians, it's it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to them. They don't know what's going on. They don't, they're they're afraid. They don't know what to do. So as a Christian and having that background and really believing wholeheartedly in God, I know that th this is him. This is him talking and we need to listen. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I said that you sound like your dad because he opened up my eyes to a lot of stuff when I had him on, on my show talking about his <laughs> And now this was, yeah, we had just started with this COVID, I think, when I had him on. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's something. I do believe that God is trying to get our attention. I mean, why else, why, why else would he shut down everything else? You know, basically. He shut it all down. <laughs> listen to me, you know, is what, what he's trying to say. Um, let's see. Uh, Demetra says, Deatris Carter is in Texas and they experienced a serious uptick in numbers as well. Yes. I've heard that. I've heard uh, Florida, Texas. Well, here in Illinois uh, or the city of Chicago, um, Lady Light, uh, Lightfoot, Lori Lightfoot, she put that um, thing into effect on this past Monday. If you came from any of the southern states on this past Monday, then you need to be in quarantine for like 14 days. Now, I don't know how many people are going to do it. But I'm sure she's looking at those numbers, you know, in those various uh, states, um, you know, the, the uptick is rising, you know, whether they want to let you know about it or not. But it's like people there, I don't know, they, maybe they had cabin fever or something and they just want to hurry up and get out. But I'm yeah, like, I don't think they should open the states back up. It yeah. really didn't make any sense to, you know, halfway close and then, you know, open up um, in sections. I really didn't understand that. And that's just from a nurse's standpoint, because we're in the hospital, you know, 24 seven, we see what it's really like. It didn't make sense for them to open it back up. There's no vaccine yet. So why open it back up yet? For the comfort of people, you know, for the cabin fever that people are experiencing, it didn't make sense to me to open back up. But I know the concern was the economy um, and what was gonna happen after that, but it didn't make sense to me. Right. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Cause you know, like you said, and even from your standpoint, I'm like, okay, cause they're in the hospital. Maybe y'all should talk to them first. And then, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you People don't really understand until they're in that position until they have a loved one who's in the hospital and is alone by themselves, and, you know, has to die alone or something like that. They're not going to take it serious until it hits them. Very true. I agree. Um, and it's something and a lot of people have lost loved ones that they weren't able to be by their side. I know a few uh, oh, yeah. that were even in our congregation who lost their loved ones and they, they weren't able to be with them. And, you know, my heart just broke for them, you know, because you probably never they probably never imagined that this is how I would lose my loved one. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's something to take seriously. It really is. And it's killing African-Americans at a rapid rate. We're at the top. Yeah. Which makes yeah. me think a lot of it is diet. It's what we're eating. Because I'm like, why is it killing African Americans the most? It's what we eat. Mm -hmm. What we consume and what we do to our bodies. Yep. Yeah. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Um, let's see. Dr. Woodard says, I agree wearing a mask will not end the coronavirus and it will not prevent you from coming in contact with the virus. Right it will prevent you from passing your respiratory droppings. It can't hurt. Right. Yeah, it's not necessarily to stop you from getting it, but it's to stop you from passing it on to someone else, yeah. Right. And I think people also have an issue with that because they don't want to feel that they are, uh, in they, that they could infect somebody else. You know what I mean? So if I'm putting on this mask, this is telling you it's a possibility that I could infect somebody else, which means I might have something. So they don't, their mind won't even take them there. You know what I mean? So they're mm -hmm. just like, no, nope, I don't want to do. You've seen it on the news. I've seen it on social media where people are just kind of like going wild and spitting all on people and doing things, you know, just crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know there should be more training. I think if our new normal is, going to be wearing these masks 
then there should be more information on how to wear it and when to put it on in public. It's not adjusting it. That don't touch the mask, you know, while you're out. When you put it on, you know, put it on before you leave the house and do not remove it until you return home. So that's a lot of part of, it has to deal with why um, they're saying it's not truly effective. It's because people are doing this in public. Um, they're, you know, touching their, their face and then putting it back on, they're taking a break. So that has a lot to do with why it's not as effective. Ah, okay. Yeah. Those are good points. Well, what about, what do you think about this? And this is just my question to you. When you're out exercising, you know, now that you're able to go out and go out exercising, like I go walking on the trail, um, you're going out because you're trying to get fresh air, you know, right. and exercising outside. So would you recommend people to use them while they're exercising, uh, the mask, or, or what do you think? That's a really good question. And I didn't even think about that if you're going out to exercise. My mentality now, what I do, I try to go out when I know that there's not a lot of people on. Orchard. Exactly. So with that, if, if there are not a lot of people on the track, I, I won't have it on. But I have it with me just in case somebody come and I'm, I'm throwing that mask on. But, you know, I don't know how effective that will still be. Like you're saying, don't, you really shouldn't be touching the mask. So I don't know. I mean, it's almost like a catch 22, right? It is. I think if you're going to be alone and you're no, and you know you're going to um, an isolated area, if you're going to exercise, exercise alone and be alone in an isolated area. Don't go to a park where you know everyone and their cousin is going to be there um, having a good old time. If you're truly alone and you know you're alone, I think you're safe to not have a mask on. But like you said, have that with you. And if you do come in contact or in close proximity with someone else, put it on and leave it on. Do not adjust it. Wait till you get back home. And also have you know some hand sanitizer with you when you do that. Yes. Okay. Good advice. Thank you. I will take heed to that. I think I've got on the, on the right track with that, but I want to yes. ask you a question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, my goodness. You guys are all on here. I do appreciate you. Uh, Rolanda says, I was terrified about going back to work. And she says she's praying for you because she, um, you mentioned about what you have to do when you go back and you're in a different mm -hmm. floor and all of that. I'm praying for you as well. Because Thank I, you. I yes. I will be on a COVID floor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine you don't want to, you don't want to be reinfected or bring back anything home to your family as well. Um, so let's see. Hey, um, Lasagna, I see you on. She says, I think companies should have a clause where employees previously infected should not have to be forced in that same environment and give different jobs or be allowed to work from home. Um, what about the post-trauma from having COVID too? I can't imagine the anxiety. That's it. And you know what? A lot of people don't talk about that. But that is very real and it is very true. It's the trauma. The trauma after having it. Having to deal with um, work. You know, being nurses, nurses have lost their jobs because of the COVID. Because they didn't have enough time. You know, they forced us to go home. If you've been exposed or if you have it, stay home for the 14 days. But if you don't have enough time, sorry about your luck. You can no longer work here. So it's the concern, you know, with work, it's the concern, you know, with finances, with me being pregnant, it's really the mental recovering from it. You know, what does it look like and how you really feel after having the COVID? When they found out that I had the COVID, they canceled all my OBGYN, all, my OBGYN canceled all my appointments. All my prenatal appointments were canceled and I was devastated. I'm like, I am in my third trimester with twins and you all don't want to see me. That is unbelievable. So what happened? Um, that, was, that was so, tra that was, it was so traumatic for me. Um, I was in tears about that the most, you know, just not being able to know what was going on with my daughter because she has the heterotaxy syndrome. Um, 
and they canceled my appointment, which was um, unbelievable to me, but they did. And I said, you know, we don't want to see you for 14 days. And after that, we'll just make your appointments virtual. And I said, how can you know what's going on with me virtually? <laughs> I'm just like, I am, I'm pregnant here. Um, but you know, that was, those were the rules and those were the regulations. And um, I said, well, um, I'm getting ready to have these twins. We don't have a birthing plan set up and you all don't want to see me. I guess we're just going to have to wing it. <laughs> and that's kind of what happened. Um, I went into labor at one, at one of my appointments um, at the end. After I had tested negative, they felt like, okay, we really do need to see this girl. You know, she's getting ready to have these babies and we don't have a plan set up. So they did eventually want to see me, but it was not till the very end. And then I went into labor unexpectedly and was rushed off. I was by myself. I was freaking out. And they're like, we need to go ahead and swab you again. And I said, oh my goodness, I'm getting ready to push these babies out. You all want to swab me. So it was a big ordeal, but they don't talk about the trauma mentally and emotionally after dealing with it. Um, hey, Jeff, your yes. video just went out. Uh-oh. Okay, guys. Wow. I don't know. I think she's going to come back in. I don't know what happened. Technology, technology. So let's see here. Um, I see you guys, uh, and I appreciate all of you that have been on here who've been commenting. I'm trying to let her come in um, so that she can finish what she was saying. And I think I have her back. She's connecting to audio. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I did that. That's okay. Technology. <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I did that. Okay. But yeah, I, I wish people would talk about it. It's not just something you get over and you move on. It's a traumatic experience, you know, not knowing if you're going to be okay, not knowing what's going to happen next, not knowing if you're going to lose your job or not. It's very hard mentally. It was hard physically, yes, but the mental I felt was much more worse. I can only imagine. Oh, and I, I can't, I can't even fathom. I really can't. All that you <laughs> deal with, my God, my God. But we know that God is the one that brought you through and um you know the prayers and your mom we appreciate now see that lady beverly i know you know this if you're still on here you couldn't get sick you couldn't because you had too much going on around you the lord knew that <laughs> or you had to be that remnant <laughs> to this day i don't understand we were very ill my father felt like he was gonna die and the fact that my mother didn't experience one symptom is like, you know, God is real. She was the one who took care of us. She went to the store on a daily basis for us. I mean, she really put herself out there. She never was once concerned about herself. Not that I saw. I mean, she stepped right in. She cared for me, Jonathan, our children, my dad, one of my brothers, one of my brother and my brother's fiance. We all got sick. So for her to just kind of walk through it, it was just like, wow. Wow. Yeah, the Lord knew exactly what to do. Let's see. Vanessa says, God bless you, baby girl. What an ordeal. God is so good. I see you mm -hmm. guys watching. Lady Beverly says, we are outside in these temps. You are fine. The virus is killed with sunlight and heat. That is why steam therapy. Oh, okay. So she's answering my question. Thank you. And, and earlier when Brandy was inquiring about um, whether or not it was you or your mom, she, she meant your mom. So hopefully, Brandy, she answered your question because she meant, you mentioned that Dr. Hill is the one that kind of helped her to get through. <laughs> to get yes, her. this is Jackson. He snuck oh, in. <laughs> That's the oldest, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, I see a ball. Um, but yeah, so this is this is great stuff. Um, the uh, problem is Rolanda says, mask it or casket. Huh? There you go. That's yeah, one way to look at it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, let's see. Oh my goodness. Bye. I appreciate all of you guys. I'm not gonna be able to go through Bye. Bye. what I want to do is um, yeah. spoken word.
that was Tommy Kansas workers for every week that we're discussing. So I want everybody to take a listen to this before we end. I'm going to come back and end with you. But okay. Listen to this. Let me get this set up. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear this. To you, you knew people who were sick, but you were one of them. Unless you thought you were asymptomatic, or so you thought. You were just living your life the way you normally do, doing what you can to be safe at all. You don't get sick, or so you thought. Waking up to a normal day, however, you're not feeling normal. Aching and chills, breathing not right. Did Miss Rose visit you over in the night? Or show sure enough. Because when you got up to go to the ER, positive results were determined. You can't go home because breathing is tougher than pneumonia is setting in. So here you go. One of the statistics being treated like you have the plague because you have the plague. Listening to whispers about the increase while watching news about those who are deceased. Lord, you're not ready, you say. If you can just get to the house of the Lord, but they're closed, staying safe virtually. And so you virtual worship with the real worship and prayer because you will not go to the town, but you must fight and survive because your kids need their mother, your king needs his queen, and you need to give God the glory. So you pray until the breathing is better. You pray until the temperature goes down. You pray until your appetite returns. You pray because you are determined to survive. Right, all right. Hopefully you were able to hear that pretty good. Uh, if not, you can go back and, and listen to it. But thank you, uh, Elder McGee, for that spoken word. I think it was right on time. Um, talking to these two queens all today and their journey, um, we, we're just appreciative of you all being transparent and sharing what you have to go through so that you can pay it forward and help someone else as well. Of course, giving God the glory, but helping others as well. Do you want to wrap us up with anything today, Jasmine? No, I thank you so much for having me on here. I really appreciate it. And again, if you all would, please follow me on YouTube. It's Jasmine Marie. And on Instagram, it's beautiful underscore Jasmine Marie. But Miss Annette, thank you so much for having me on here. Definitely everyone wear your mask, wash your hands, stay home if you can, and please just keep me in your prayers because I do have to go to back. I do have to go back to work and I am going to be on a COVID floor. So please keep me in your prayers. Well, we are definitely going to do that. We're going to uh, be praying for you and pray that God will continue to bless you and strengthen you and that you will not get this virus again. I don't even want to come in nowhere near you. If no. Come in, then the spirit of the Lord be like, no, you can't touch her anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, my fear is that it comes back and it mutates and it's stronger. That's my true fear is um, that it comes back more powerful in the second wave. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll pray against that. We'll pray to that avail as well. Yes. Um, the Bible says, let, let your request be made known. So that's there you go. You all make sure you pray for her. Keep her in your prayers. Um, also, uh, Prophetess Rolanda, we thank you again for yes. being on today. I want to thank all of you for watching, those of you that have shared your comments, your questions, those that I didn't get to on today. Thank you so much. Angie, I see you over here on the watch party. You guys are on the watch party. You are on the uh, Facebook Live and then also on YouTube. So thank you again. I appreciate it. We are going to continue on with COVID survivors during the month of July on Mind, Body, and Soul. So don't miss a beat. Next week, I'm going to have I'm, I am going to have a young lady. She I know she's probably going to tell me uh, that she doesn't really want to be on, but she wants to tell her story. You know, you get a lot of people that are in the background that don't want to be up front. But I'm pulling her up front. So uh, Missionary Carolyn Smith is going to be on from Abounding Life, Church of God in Christ. And also, I'm going to have gospel artist Calvin Bridges. Many of you know him. You've heard his music. He's going to come on next week and tell about his journey with COVID-19. So don't miss a beat. July 15th, next Wednesday, 12 noon Central Standard Time. Meet me here. More. Oh, 
survivors uh, are going to come in and share their That's journey. That's awesome. Yeah. That's powerful, yes. Yeah, it, it, it's something. But you guys made it. You, you, the Lord has blessed you to come out of it. And this is what we want to hear. Um, we hear a lot of doom and gloom, but we see how the Lord has blessed you all. And right. thank you again for sharing everything, for being transparent. Tell Jackson I said, hey. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, he's a handsome self. But again, thank you. Um, go to my website, guys, if you want to uh, keep up with me and you want to get caught in the net. Go to getcaughtinanetradio.com, getcaughtinanetradio.com, and you will find all of our information, past shows, upcoming shows, and what else we have going on. So we're going to get out of here. Let me play my end jingle. And Jasmine, you take care. You are covered under the blood. Just Amen. Amen. All right. Take care, guys. We will see you next Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys, take care, take care. Make sure you go to getcaughtinternetradio.com. Also, go to my YouTube channel if you have not subscribed. Please take time to do so on today. Go to YouTube, type in Get Caught in a Net, A-N-E-T. And please subscribe and click the bell so that you will know when I go live. All right, we're out of here. You take care. Be safe. Wash your hands. Wear your mask. Be safe for you and your family. Peace.